Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting here in Madison, Wisconsin. We are very glad to have you with us for tonight's Bible study. Tonight we are continuing in our fairly new study of the book of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And we hope to be covering Leviticus chapters 21 through 25 tonight. So we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Leviticus chapter 21. As always, if you have any questions or comments about tonight's class, if you have some something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send a message to me by emailing info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also call or send a text to 608 224 0274. And I'm actually recording this class on Tuesday, uh, right around the middle of the day. Up to this point, I have survived my annual physical and visit to the dermatologist. So I uh, got to train a few interns this morning. They came, uh, saw me coming and said, uh, this guy looks like a good way to learn. And uh, so that was a, a neat thing this morning to contribute to the furtherance of science, I suppose. And uh, thankfully, good news from the dermatologist and my nurse practitioner they said that I was medically boring and uh, boring is apparently good when you go in for a physical and uh, to see the dermatologist so I'm thankful for that uh, have the first shingles vaccine on board so I'm kind of waiting for that hammer to fall and see what happens there and uh, blood work done and all of that but uh, so far so good good news and I'm very thankful for the good medical care uh, that we have here in the city of Madison but as I said tonight we are continuing in our study of Leviticus we haven't been in here long but we we are booking it through this book. We are moving rather quickly. A major theme in the book of Leviticus is holiness, that is being separate or different set apart from the world around us. And we've learned that Leviticus is basically a handbook or a manual for the priests, for those who were responsible for helping the people maintain this holiness before the Lord. Uh, early on in this book, we've had a, a summary of the major types of sacrifices, and we've seen the priest ordained. We've seen the first catastrophe as Nadab and Abihu offer unauthorized fire before the Lord, and they are killed on the spot for doing that. Uh, we've had a summary of what is clean and unclean We've had some revolutionary guidelines for preventing outbreaks of disease from a scientific point of view. It's absolutely amazing to find some of these uh, guidelines for quarantine and diagnosing various skin diseases way back in around 1400 or so BC. Um, we've also looked at the holiest day of the year, the Day of Atonement. We went into detail on that. That's the one where the high priest would make a sacrifice for himself, then he'd make a sacrifice for the people, and then he would also put the sins of the people on the scapegoat goat and they would uh, sacrifice one goat and the scapegoat though they would send off into the wilderness kind of sending the sins of the people far away as that goat went off to wander. Uh, uh, two weeks ago before I left for a week at our youth camp we looked at a rather lengthy series of commands that were intended to make a clear distinction between God's people and the locals up there in the promised land where they're heading and we move rather quickly through those just giving the highlights and giving a kind of a brief summary and over overview of that. Basically, we started off with a long list of sexual sins, and then we had a wide variety of other rules and regulations. Basically, just making sure that God's people would be different from the world around them in the land where they were moving. And I know last week was different with me being out of town, but I hope all of you were able to get the link. I know it didn't go out by YouTube, and we addressed that the week before, kind of uh, doing the best we could to communicate that. Uh, but a link went out by email. I think it's also posted on the private um, Facebook live stream group. But that was of Jared Jackson presenting a lecture down in Missouri not too long ago uh, concerning that theory that heaven will be on the earth, kind of the rejuvenated earth theory where we're not going to be actually going to heaven, but God is just going to uh, cleanse the surface of the earth, kind of uh, burn the top off, and then we're all going to be back here on the earth for the rest of eternity. And so uh, this is basically heaven is where we are right now. And he refuted that theory. I thought he had some very good thoughts, and I would appreciate your feedback on there, but I'm thankful for Brother Jared. Uh, the Jackson family has been a friend of our family for many, many years, and I appreciate the good words that he had on that. So that was kind of our fill-in for last Wednesday evening while I was up at Bible camp. But tonight we're jumping back into Leviticus and we plan on looking at some rules that were specific to the priest. And this will be in chapters 21 and 22 tonight. And then we're going to be doing just a broad overview of the major feast days. And these are covered in Leviticus chapters 23, 24, and 25. 
Well, let's start out tonight with some rules that were specific to the priest and kind of to give us a taste for what's in these next two chapters without reading all two chapters. Let's take a look at the opening paragraph. This is Leviticus chapter 21, and let's look at verses 1 through 9. Leviticus chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. Then the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, No one shall defile himself for a dead person among his people, except for his relatives who are nearest to him, his mother and his father and his son and his daughter and his brother, also for his virgin sister who is near to him because she has had no husband. For her he may defile himself. He shall not defile himself as a relative by marriage among his people, and so profane himself. They shall not make any baldness on their heads, nor shave off the edges of their beards, nor make any cuts in their flesh. They shall be holy to their God, and not profane the name of their God. For they shall present the offerings by fire to the Lord, the food of their God, so they shall be holy. They shall not take a woman who is profaned by harlotry, nor shall they take a woman divorced from her husband, for he is holy to his God. You shall consecrate him, therefore, for he offers the food of your God. He shall be holy to you, for I, the Lord who sanctifies you, am holy. Also, the daughter of any priest, if she profanes herself by harlotry, she profanes her father, she shall be burned with fire. In a way, this almost seems like a bit of clarification for some of the rules for everybody that we've already considered. Most of this, for example, is about being defiled by touching a dead body. And here God makes sure that everybody knows that this rule also applies to the priest, but he's making an exception, it seems, for immediate family. And so if your mother, father, brother, sister, son, or daughter, or unmarried sister, I guess we should say, die, uh, you can touch those bodies when they die, but you cannot touch the bodies of your in-laws. And so it was very specific, those in your immediate family not related by marriage. And the priest must also not shave their heads. They were not to make any cuts on their bodies. Uh, they were not to trim their beards in a particular way. And apparently this is most likely a local practice by the pagans that was done to honor the dead. And so that's my understanding of that. It's not explained here. That's the best that I can come up with. But I, I think the idea here is God's people were to be different. And you are not to be like the people around you in doing what they do to honor the dead. So also priests were prevented from taking wives who had been prostitutes in the past or previously married for any reason. And that seems to be an above and beyond type uh, command that was special to the priest and the daughters of the priest if they were to become prostitutes. Uh, they were to be burned with fire. And I don't know if we have that for other daughters among the people, but the priests were serving in a leadership role. And so the kids in that family were important. I know they didn't ask to be that important. They were born into that. Uh, but their families appear to be held to a higher standard under the law of Moses. And again, we won't be reading every verse tonight in these two chapters, but in the rest of this chapter, starting in verses 10 through 15, if you want to just skim through this on your own, we find that the high priest was held to an even higher standard than the regular priests. Uh, for example, uh, he couldn't even touch the dead bodies of his mother and father. And so if you were serving in the role of high priest, that is the leader of the other priest, you weren't even able to touch the bodies of your loved ones. And he's not even allowed to marry a widow, which was normally allowed. In verses 16 through the end of the chapter, we find that the priests who serve in the temple were to be physically perfect. And so the blind were excluded. Anyone who was disfigured or deformed in any way was excluded from serving as priests. So no hunchbacks, no dwarves, and on and on and on. Those who actually served in the temple, they were to be physically perfect. Now, of course, if you were a Levite and you had some physical problem, some deformity, you could still serve, uh, but in some other way. Uh, you may be carrying firewood or disposing of this or that or cleaning or something of, of that nature. Well, in Leviticus chapter 22, if we move over into chapter 22, um, God then goes on to remind the priest to treat the sacrifices with the utmost of respect. And so he's speaking to the leaders, to the priests here. And of course, there would be a tendency over time to become complacent. And as you're offering sacrifices one after the other, after the other, after the other, all day long, uh, it would be very easy to forget how important all of this really is, especially if you are living and working right there in and around the tabernacle. 
And so it would be easy to become complacent and not to treat this job as the holy job that it is. And so in Leviticus 22 verses 1 through 9, if you skim forward, you'll notice God explains that the Levites can't even serve in the temple if they're sick or if they are unclean for any reason at all. And so there is a plan for cleansing so that they may serve in the future. So if something happens, if you get sick, uh, you'd have to take a break and uh, let somebody pick up where you left off until you were uh, ceremonially clean once again. Well, continuing down in Leviticus 22, 10 through 16, we've got regulations as to who could eat the food of the sacrifices. If you remember, uh, God allowed the priests to eat a portion of the sacrificial food that was offered. But here God clarifies exactly who could eat it. The food was reserved for the priestly families. If you were a priest, you couldn't have a guest over for dinner uh, to eat the food that had been sacrificed. If your daughter marries someone who is not a priest, she's out. She can no longer eat that food. She's got to stop eating the priestly food and so on. And then at the end, if you eat holy food by mistake, there is a plan for making restitution. You must pay that back. And there is a, a process for that. So the food is holy and is not be, to be consumed by those outside the Levitical priesthood. And then in Leviticus 22, 17 through 30, we've got a reminder that the sacrifices themselves had to be absolutely perfect in every possible way. No disease, no damage at all, couldn't have any scars from being attacked by an animal, none of that. And if somebody brings a diseased or damaged animal to be sacrificed, it had to be rejected. So let's close kind of the first part of our study tonight by just looking at the last few verses of Leviticus chapter 22. So we're looking at Leviticus 21-22, we've read the first paragraph, and now we are reading the last paragraph in Leviticus 22. So this is Leviticus chapter 22, we're looking at verses uh, 31 through 33. He says, So you shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. You shall not profane my holy name, but I will be sanctified among the sons of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you who brought you out from the land of Egypt to be your God, I am the Lord. And again, we've had the rules, and now this is kind of a summary statement based on what we've learned over these past two chapters. The people, and especially the priest, have to be holy or set apart. And they are to stay holy by obeying the Lord's commandments continually. And as the one who brought them out of Egypt, God has every right to demand this. This isn't just some random pagan deity asking this. This is the God who saved his people. They owe him absolutely everything. All right, so this now brings us to the, the second half, or the second two-thirds, I think, would be more accurate of our study tonight. So this brings us to Leviticus chapters 23, 24, and 25. And tonight we plan on using the rest of our time together to do an overview of the major religious holidays. And we have an introduction to this section in Leviticus 23, verses 1 and 2. Notice what he says, Leviticus 23, 1 and 2. The Lord spoke again to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, The Lord's appointed times which you shall proclaim as holy convocations my appointed times are these. And uh, I don't know about you, my translation has a, a colon right there, as if the, so there's more coming. So here come the bullet points. He's about to explain this. So going into this, God is revealing what is basically to be a schedule. It is to be a yearly calendar. And some of these things are going to happen on a weekly basis. Some of these are tied to the Sabbath day. Others are not tied to the Sabbath day. Some are tied to a month or maybe a time of year, a season, celebrating the harvest, for example. But we're talking about a series of uh, feasts or sacred assemblies, or perhaps we might describe these as holidays. Literally, they are holy days. You know, I know a lot of times people will make a big deal. Uh, are, you, are you not supposed to say Merry Christmas? And so instead, you, you're supposed to say Happy Holidays. And I just get a kick out of that. Uh, because in a sense, if you think about it, holiday holy day, in my mind, should be even more offensive than Christmas. So I don't get it. I don't care. I think a lot of us don't care. And I think a lot of people in the world really don't care either. Uh, but I just wanted to point that out. These are holy days. Literally, they are holy days, holidays. So as we do an overview of the major holidays, I want to arrange the rest of tonight's study into the form of a chart. 
And I don't know about you personally, I, I appreciate having something like this in chart form. I mean, we could read chapters, you know, uh, 23, 24, 25 straight through, and I, I don't even think it would make as much sense reading it as it would summarizing it and seeing it in chart form and boiling it down. And so this is kind of like the chart that we did with the major sacrifices. And once again, I am relying quite heavily tonight on the chart in the NIV study Bible that I have had forever. It just, it does a good job summarizing these in a way that I can understand. And this goes back many years. It's not exactly the same. I have tweaked this a little bit. I've simplified it also to fit on our screen tonight, just uh, getting the basics down here. Uh, but I want to add these holy days one at a time as we go down here. So by the time we get to the end of our study tonight, we should have a pretty good overview of the major feast days in uh, the religious life of God's people back in the time of Moses. And remember, this is part of what is basically a handbook for the priests. So if you are a priest, this is what you need to know concerning the, the feast and the holy days that are going to happen throughout the year. Um, from time to time through my life, I'll run across like a, a minister's handbook. And if you've ever done any preaching, maybe you're familiar with that. A lot of times it's a little black book and it'll have and just a summary of what to say at a funeral, what to say at the, the bedside of somebody who's passing away, what to do here, what scriptures to read now and then, and so on. And I would kind of think of the book of Leviticus in that way. This, this would look good, kind of bound in leather and a little uh, something you could put in a, your coat or pants pocket. And uh, again, it is a handbook for the priest. This is what you need to know concerning these uh, holidays that you're going to be responsible for uh, leading the people through throughout the year. Well, at the top of this list, let's notice that we have the Sabbath. And so we don't want to leave that out. That is the most basic of all of the holy days. And the reference here is in Leviticus 23, verse 3. And if you're following along in your Bible, I hope you have a Bible open in your lap or on your device at home. But in Leviticus 23, verse 3, God says, There are six days when you may do work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest. A day of sacred assembly, you are not to do any work wherever you live. It is a Sabbath to the Lord. And we know this. We've studied this back in Exodus. God explained the Sabbath just a few chapters even before he gave the Ten Commandments. But as I understand it from Scripture, the Sabbath was only given to the Jewish people. As far as we know, no other nation on earth was ever told to honor the Sabbath day as the Jews were told. And this is important because there are some people out there in the religious world today who say that the Sabbath or Saturday is still the Lord's Day and that we should still worship on Saturday, not Sunday. And I don't know if you caught it. I had a slip of the tongue on Sunday as I was introducing what's coming next in our study of Proverbs. I said that on July or August 4th, the first Saturday in August, we were going to study laziness from the book of Proverbs. I don't know why I said that. I meant to say the first Sunday in August, we are not switching our worship to Saturday or the Sabbath. So sorry about that. As I was getting that lesson edited, ready to get online, I was listening to it and uh, I just noticed that slip of the tongue there. Anyway, we worship on the Lord's day, the day that the Lord was raised from the dead, uh, the first day of the week, the day that the Lord's church was established, the gospel was first preached in its fullness in Acts chapter 2. So the early church made a point of coming together on the first day of the week, the day of the Lord's resurrection, and that is when they were told to be giving in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. It's also the day that they came together to partake of the Lord's Supper. But this is the basic and, and most uh, the, the first of the major uh, holidays, every seventh day. So very simple right up here at the beginning. Next on the list, we have now a Sabbath for the land, a Sabbath year. And this reference comes to us in Leviticus 25, 1 through 7. Basically, uh, they were to grow their food for six years and they were to let the land rest on the seventh. They could eat what came up on its own. Um, but they were not allowed to till. They were not allowed to plant on the seventh year. They were to just give the land a rest. And of course, today we know the value of land conservation. We know that the abuse of the land here in this country uh, led to the Dust Bowl uh, many years back. But back in those days, this is how they were to do it. And I don't know if we actually have a record of them ever doing this, but this is God's commandment. And wouldn't that take a lot of faith? Imagine being a farmer, and it's seventh year rolls around, and you've got this seed, and God has said, don't plant. That would be so difficult, wouldn't it, 
to have a barn full of seed ready to go and God said don't plant but this I'm a farmer I plant so I don't know if they ever obeyed this command I don't think we have a record of them actually obeying it doesn't mean they didn't it just means that we don't have it uh, in scripture here but that that would be a huge leap of faith to just live off of your savings for an entire year some of you have done that and uh, what a challenge that is so that would take some planning it would also take a major leap of faith well next on this list we have the year of jubilee and this one is described for us in leviticus chapter 25 8 through 55 and so there's quite a bit about it in the book of uh, leviticus uh, most of these, by the way, are also described elsewhere in the Old Testament, mostly in Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But for the year of Jubilee, it's basically a huge reset. And it is to happen every seven Sabbath years on the 50th year. And several things were to happen during the year of Jubilee. For one, all land was to return to the original family who owned it when they first showed up in the Promised Land. Um, over time, of course, land has a way of changing hands. People would buy and sell and trade, but at the 50th year, everything resets back to the way it was when they first showed up in Canaan. Now imagine buying a house today knowing that in 35 years or whatever, the land that you're buying would revert to the original owners. Wouldn't you take that into account with the purchase price? You absolutely would. And so if I come to Madison to buy a house and I know Jubilee is two years away, that's going to be a whole different negotiation than if the Jubilee was 40 or 45 years away. And so in a sense then, it would almost be more like a long-term lease. I mean, it was a sale, but it was going to revert to the original owners after a while. And this was a reminder that the land ultimately belonged to God. God is the true owner. And so the land was never to be sold permanently. Um, now, this also has a way of protecting the poor. So imagine if you lost everything through sickness or tragedy or maybe even through poor financial management. Uh, this poverty would not necessarily extend through all future generations of your family. Uh, but instead, there was a big reset coming. And so caring for the poor was, was uh, uh, one mission or, or one, uh, I guess, objective of this. And speaking of the poor, God also gives some further instruction in the context of the year of Jubilee in this chapter that if somebody becomes poor, everybody has to step in to support this person. You are not to treat him like a slave, but they are to treat them like a hired worker. And so they are to respect even those who are desperate. They are not to take advantage of the poor in any way whatsoever. Also, if someone gets to the point where they need to basically sell themselves to you as a slave, uh, that slave and his family are to be released during the year of Jubilee. And so that slavery was not permanent. And so there was this uh, glimmer of hope, even for those who had to sell themselves into slavery. And once again, I don't think we have an actual record of them celebrating the year of Jubilee. You would think that we would have some record of this throughout all the, the records we have in history of God's people back then in Scripture. But as far as we know, uh, we have no actual record of them actually celebrating this. And I meant to look up the verse, but I didn't. But I believe that the 70 years in Babylonian captivity were God's way of condemning them for not taking those years of Jubilee. And that was his way of giving the land more of a long-term rest uh, to make up for the abuses through the years and of their disobedience to this particular command. Well, the next one comes out in this list is the Passover. We already studied the origin of the Passover when we worked our way through Exodus last year. So we know that the Passover was God's way of having uh, the people remember God passing over, uh, the angel of the Lord passing over and not killing their firstborn. If they had slaughtered the lamb as instructed and had smeared its blood on the doorpost. And we read about that back in Exodus chapter 12. So it's just a brief reference here, uh, but we do need to mention it in this chart. Uh, clearly uh, and very closely associated with the Passover, we've got the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which starts the day after the Passover. It involves eating unleavened bread for a week, again as a reminder of that time when the people left Egypt in a hurry and only had time to make bread without giving it time to rise. So they mixed it, they baked it, they ate it very quickly. They were on the run. Uh, this is the first meal that was really intended to be eaten in that way. And so every year after that, therefore, they were to celebrate the Passover and then eat unleavened bread for the following week. And obviously we have a connection to the Lord's Supper today, 
which celebrates Jesus as our Passover. That reference is in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And uh, that feast or that meal, in a sense, that memorial, uh, also involves eating unleavened bread. And so we have that connection between the old and the new. This brings us to the Feast of the First Fruits. And the reference comes in Leviticus 23, 9 through 14. Basically, the barley harvest came first fairly early in the year. And so they were to take a sheaf or little bundle of barley, the first of the harvest, and they were to offer it before the Lord as a sacrifice. And if I've understood this correctly, they were not to eat any bread before this. So this was kind of the beginning of the bread season. Uh, today, of course, we have bread all year round, don't we? We go to Woodman's or uh, Metro Market, pick and save, whatever. We, we can get bread any time of year. But back then, though, it seems to have come in stages. And it was certainly tied to the harvest as the barley was harvested and then later the wheat. And so that first uh, sacrifice to the Lord was from the barley harvest. The next one on the list is the Feast of Weeks. Uh, the Feast of the First Fruits. Uh, it's also called, I could have put that up here, but this one is tied to the main harvest. So the barley was kind of the first of the first. The wheat, the main harvest normally came in about seven weeks after the barley harvest and they were to offer flour on this one along with the animals that were sacrificed and later since this was to take place 50 days after the passover it was known due to the greek influence as pentecost and it was never assigned this role in scripture but in later years this one came to be known as the anniversary of the date that moses received the commandments on mount sinai and so the Feast of Weeks, the uh, Pentecost, this harvest celebration was also a celebration of the anniversary of the giving of the law, which I think is incredibly interesting because in a sense, God's new law, the gospel, was also first publicly proclaimed on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And I, I just, it's not nailed down for us in scripture, whether that's the intent, but to me that, that just seems to be on purpose. That does not seem to be a coincidence. Well, after this, we, uh, we've got a holiday where they blew trumpets, <laughs> the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, not much we know about it in later years. This was kind of their New Year's Day celebration. It was later known and is known today as Rosh Hashanah. Um, we shoot fireworks, maybe, on New Year's Day. In, a, in our family, when we were kids, I remember going outside and banging on pots and pans. Well, they made noise also. They blew trumpets for this particular holiday, so the Feast of Trumpets. Well, this brings us back around to the Day of Atonement. Again, we've already studied this one in some detail a few weeks ago when we studied Leviticus 16. Uh, but it's also mentioned here in Leviticus 23, 23 through 26. This one takes place 10 days after the Feast of Trumpets. And as we learned a few weeks ago, this was probably the most important holy day of the year. Uh, this is the big one. This is the sacrifice where all the sins from the previous year were forgiven. They were to humble their souls. That was the command earlier. And that, as I pointed out a few weeks ago, that was interpreted to be a reference to fasting. Although fasting is never commanded, that right there, that's the closest we get to a command to abstain from food for religious reasons under the law of Moses. Uh, this is the one where they would sacrifice the one goat and then send the other out as a scapegoat, carrying the sins of the people off into the wilderness. So this one today is known as Yom Kippur. Um, although without the temple, they obviously don't do the whole scapegoat thing over there. A lot of this they can no longer physically do. They, they are no longer in control of the temple mount. Uh, next on our list is the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Tents. Depending on uh, your translation, and I think this is one of the most interesting of the holidays. The reference comes in Leviticus 23, 33 through 36, the first part of that verse. And this one comes five days after the Day of Atonement, and they are to live in tents for a week to remember living in tents during those years when they wandered in the wilderness. And even today, people, Jewish people, will live in tents, little shelters or shanties in their backyards, little shelters out there, maybe palm branches on the top, little structure made out of uh, sticks or uh, kind of logs poked into the ground, but uh, kind of a neat thing, a lot of community building going on right there. This is something children would remember and certainly look forward to. So I think God has a an awesome sense of imagination thinking up you know we're going to remember living in tents by you know from here on you got to live in tents for one week out of the year and uh, some people would hate it <laughs> some people would love it uh, but whatever your view toward that uh, it was very important to remember living in tents in the wilderness uh, this next one is just a very brief reference it seems to be tied to the feast of tabernacles it's almost like a 
a closing ceremony to the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles, just kind of to wrap that up, give some a sense of closure to it, one little assembly down at the end. We could almost tack that on with one of those others. But then here at the end, since we are studying Esther, we are just throwing Purim in there as one of the major holidays. It's not mentioned in Leviticus, uh, but the Jewish people started celebrating this after Esther steps up and courageously saves her people. So that didn't happen for hundreds of years after this. That's why it's not in Exodus, but this is one of those that ended up on their yearly calendar. Kind of wanted to throw that in here at the end, just so we don't forget it. So uh, this is the overview. If you want to take a screenshot or, or whatever, if you're taking notes, need any of this clarified, let me know. Uh, we'll leave it up here at least a few seconds if you want to uh, make a record of this. But this is an overview of the holy days for God's people as explained to the Levites, the men who would be responsible for actually making all of this happen. God is saying, this is what you need to know about the holy days in the yearly calendar of God's people. Before we close tonight, we've got one random little passage within this section that doesn't really fit. And so let's take a look at this. This is Leviticus 24, Leviticus 24, verses 10 through 23. Leviticus 24, 10 through 23, kind of a weird placement. It's got a little text here that doesn't really fit with the others, but let's cover it. Leviticus 24, 10 through 23. Now the son of an Israelite woman whose father was an Egyptian went out among the sons of Israel and the Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel struggled with each other in the camp. The son of the Israelite woman blasphemed the name and cursed. So they brought him to Moses. Now his mother's name was Shelomith, the daughter of Dibri of the tribe of Dan. They put him in custody so that the command of the Lord might be made clear to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring the one who is cursed outside the camp, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head. Then let all the congregation stone him. You shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, If anyone curses his God, then he will bear his sin. Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him. The alien as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, he shall be put to death. If a man takes the life of any human being, he shall surely be put to death. The one who takes the life of an animal shall make it good, life for life. If a man injures his neighbor just as he has done, so it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, just as he has injured a man, so it shall be inflicted on him. Thus the one who kills an animal shall make it good, but the one who kills a man shall be put to death. There shall be one standard for you, it shall be for the stranger as well as the native, for I am the Lord your God. Then Moses spoke to the sons of Israel, and they brought the one who had cursed outside the camp and stoned him with stones. Thus the sons of Israel did just as the Lord had commanded Moses. What a strange account. And what a strange placement of this right here in the middle of everything concerning the feast days. Isn't that weird? You got, you know, keep the Sabbath, got day of atonement, boom, kill this guy because he blasphemed the Lord's name. So uh, strange placement, but the way I see it, it probably happened right here as God is explaining all of this. And so this is like a giant parenthesis. <laughs> they put it right here in the text. So we've got this Israelite woman and an Egyptian man who have a son together. That right there is a serious problem. They are divided religiously. So this young man grew up probably religiously confused and their son gets in a fight with an Israelite man. And as they're fighting, the guy with the Egyptian dad and the Israelite mom blasphemes the name of the Lord. So he curses using God's name in some way. Do people today ever curse when they're fighting? Isn't that strange? Still the same. I mean, going back like 1400 something years and, and people when they fight are still talking like this. So absolutely, we're familiar with this. They had just received the law uh, concerning cursing using God's name. So they hold the guy and it's almost like, I think we know what needs to happen here, but man, that's severe, let's kind of make sure. So they don't kill him on the spot, but they hold him until they figure this out. So this is one of the few times in scripture where we have somebody actually taken into custody in the wilderness. Remember a few weeks ago, we made the point, they really didn't have jails back then. I mean, it was the death penalty or something else, but it was not, um, you know, 
staying in a jail cell for 20 years. They didn't have long sentences like that. It was either death or some punishment or fine. So they take him to custody until they can figure it out. At this point, God steps in and helps them deal with what is basically a test case. Um, this is a first. So here, this is what you do. The instruction is bring the man outside the camp. Everybody who heard him curse is to put their hands on his head and they are to stone him with stones. Isn't that personal? I, in my mind, this would really cut down on lying about somebody or something you've seen. You know, if the witnesses had to actually do the stoning or at least take a leading role in it, I mean, you got to touch the guy. You had to put your hand on the guy's head before you did it. Uh, that would make a lot of people, I, I think, think twice about lying and uh, maybe some false witness that would cause a guy to be killed for uh, illegitimate reasons. So this was personal. Uh, God elaborates. You also do the same thing if somebody takes somebody's life and so on. So this would be something of a demonstration. And so they do it exactly as God has commanded. They stone the man to death right there. Well, that brings us to the end of our, I think, sixth lesson from the book of Leviticus. We have now studied the first 25 chapters. So we have been uh, moving through this book rather quickly, covering an average of just over, I think, four chapters a week. Uh, next week, we hope to finish this book. I, it kind of snuck up on me here. It's shorter than I remembered it. Um, I've been enjoying looking at this, but we're going to study next week some blessings God promises for obedience, as well as some consequences, the outlines for disobedience. That's in chapter 26. And then we'll end in chapter 27 with some regulations for offerings that are promised to the Lord. And that'll bring us to the end of Leviticus. As always, thank you so much for being with us tonight. If there's something that we need to be praying about, if there's some way that we can help or encourage you as a church, we hope you'll get in touch with us. You can send an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also give me a call or send me a text, 608-224-0274. Uh, looking forward to seeing you this coming Lord's Day. But as we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we have learned tonight that you are a God who loves to celebrate with your people. And you are also a God who wants us to remember what you've done for us. Thank you, Father, for Jesus, our Passover, and thank you for establishing his supper, the Lord's Supper, as an ongoing memorial. We pray that you will continue to make us holy just as you are holy. Father, we want to be more and more like you every day. Thank you, Father, for making us a part of your kingdom, the church. We love you, and we come to you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.